perhaps we're going to be in a world where you grow up with a virtual assistant and it understands you really, really well and it can be your, your confidant. You might be able to talk to it when you have problems and things like that. Also, we'll probably have more things that are more tactile. So we might have a world where instead of having something like a smart speaker that sits on your, your table, maybe we'll have something that you could hold and you could touch and might have a nicer sensation and something that's a little more um, interactive in that way. Hi, I'm Bianca from Bot Society. Today we're here at the Google campus to talk with Kathy Pearl, the head of conversation design outreach at Google. So, Kathy, how did you get your start in conversation design? Sure, so it's been, gosh, almost 20 years. I started at a company called Nuance Communications and we made phone systems, IVRs, those things you, you talk to instead of a computer instead of a person. And at the time, the technology was pretty limited. So we had to handcraft everything that we expected a, a caller to say, every uh and um and please. Um, but we learned a whole lot about how uh, conversational experiences work. So a lot of that I've carried forward uh, even today. That's great. Can you tell us a little bit about what conversational design actually is? Yeah, conversational design is how we basically create experiences uh, where we teach computers how to communicate more like humans and not the other way around. Because we all know how to talk, we all know how to have conversations, and it's better to build a system that takes advantage of how humans are already speaking rather than force humans to learn how to talk like computers do. Can you tell us a bit about why it's important to design a conversation prior to building it? Yeah, so with some design, for example, website design, a lot of times we focus on the structure first and put in filler words and then we add the real content later. With conversation design, the conversation is the structure and that's going to impact the software team because they're going to need to develop uh, the structure in a certain way. As an example, thinking about business hours, if I'm looking at my phone and I want to know what time a business is open, you can just show me a visual card of information. I can decide for myself, is it open for lunch? When does it close on Fridays? But if I ask you, is it open for lunch on Wednesday? I want to hear a more natural response, like, yes, it's open for lunch. And so we have to build maybe 60 plus different responses for that basic question of what time is a business open, which is different than visual design where maybe you could have like one card of information. So a lot of people ask us, why is it important to start with conversation? Why do we start with sample dialogues? Assistant experiences have to come to life on all kinds of surfaces. Every single one of these surfaces have conversation. That's the common denominator, but not all of these surfaces have screens. So we have to make sure that the conversation is in place so that we can extend the interaction to surfaces that actually do have screens. I think it's quite important in the sense it's like with the complexity of information we're providing on World Cup, there need to, we need to look into what is the sum of the interaction model probably is also on screen and how it complements in between the voice components of information and also kind of like let's say cards or carousels that we're providing on screen. So make sure they are interacting with each other without being redundant in a sense. That's a good point, Andrew, because Assistant has a lot of moving parts. Yeah. There's the chat bubble text, there's the TTS, there's the cards and carousels, or yeah. suggestion chips, and all of these things have to work in concert to deliver a single cohesive experience. Yeah. How is conversational design different from traditional visual design? One of the things I think about with visual design is we usually know what the user did. They tapped a button, they swiped, they selected a menu item. With conversation design, it's a little bit more of an educated guess. We have a pretty good idea of what they said. There is such huge variety in the way that people ask for something even as simple as setting an alarm or a timer. There's 50 different ways I want to set a timer for 8 a.m. or an alarm for 8 p.m. And so we have to anticipate and realize and spend time designing on the fact that there's a whole lot of ways that people might ask for the exact same thing. Kathy, in your opinion, how human should bots be? My philosophy is that we are not interested in fooling anyone into thinking they're talking to a human. Instead, it's about leveraging the way that people already know how to communicate. So if we can take advantage of the way that people are already used to talking, it's going to make their experience that much easier. How do companies begin thinking about conversational design? The biggest thing is just being aware that conversation design is a thing. That gets you like halfway there. And then realizing that um, you need to hire resources for that. So either hire conversation designers or train your designers in that field so they understand how best to design for that. We take one of these examples and run it through the um, sample dialogue. There's a poll back and forth. Sure. Why don't we do the schedule one? Okay. Who is, when is England playing next? 
So one of the things that we constantly have to manage as conversational design designers is um, ma managing the user's short-term memory. Mm -hmm. We can't present too much information. But the great thing about a screen is it, it provides the static affordance to present all kinds of information. Um, so this is a great opportunity to you know, show a card with the standings or, or the, the, the schedule for the coming days. Is conversation design really that important in the early stages of a project? It definitely helps to start your conversation design in the beginning. That's for a variety of reasons. One reason is that we still can't do everything we want to design for, technically speaking. So a designer needs to understand the technical constraints very clearly up front so they can design around them. In addition, it's really important to have buy-in from the project managers, the software team, and they make sure that everyone's on the same page about what you're developing and can it be done and can it be done in the time you want. So starting with that discussion about the design right up front is going to make sure you have the most successful design possible. What is a multimodal experience where conversation is concerned? So we're getting to have more and more surfaces, for example, with the Google Assistant, more and more ways in which someone can interact. For example, we have things like the Google Home, which is a voice-only experience, but we've also got the Google Assistant on your phone, where you might speak, or you might type, or you might tap. We've also got things like uh, smart displays, uh, where it's not quite a tablet, it's not quite a phone, but it's what we call voice forward. So you might be doing a lot of speaking, but then tapping or swiping when needed. So yeah, I think the main thing is we just want to remember that conversation is not about just voice. I mean, I think a lot of people have that interpretation and we want to remind people that actually it's multimodal, it could be typing, it could be interacting in different ways and make sure designers are really thinking about that, not just the really voice focused. That's a great point, Kathy, because in a lot of times people invoke these interactions using assistant, but they're in public places where they don't want to hear a response back. So the text on the screen has to be conversational as well in case people are just reading the experience instead of just hearing it. What is the most important thing to remember when you're brainstorming the dialogue for a conversation? I think one of the main things is to realize that people are going to say things that you didn't expect. Even if you've been doing this for a long time, you'll still be surprised when you put it out there in the world and people talk to your conversational experience and you're like, oh wow, I didn't expect that. So you have to make sure you set aside enough time to gather that data and do some iterating so that your system will be able to respond to all the different ways that people talk. What has surprised you the most since beginning to work in the space? I would say a couple things. One is that the technology itself has improved so much. I mean, it's amazing what we can do with our speech recognition nowadays. Another big difference is in the use case. So now we have these smart speakers that sit in shared family spaces a lot of the time, and the whole family uses them for things like playing music, uh, playing a game, asking questions, and it brings about a more communal aspect to this technology than just having like a one-on-one -on -one conversation on the phone. How important is collaboration for your team as you begin to set industry standards and start educating a larger audience? One of the main things I do as head of outreach for conversation design is really try to go out there in the world and bring awareness about what we do and why it's important. So it's so important for me to be collaborating with lots of different designers in this space, understanding where people are pushing the boundaries, where people are having problems, where there are misunderstandings about how to use the technology. So the more we can bring the message out there in the world about this is how we do this type of design, it's going to raise the bar for everybody because more and more people will be able to create these really great conversational experiences. According to the end focus in principle, new information, the focal information, in this case what the user is looking to hear as an answer, goes at the end of the sentence. The flip side of the coin is that old information is usually maintained in the subject of the sentence. In this case, the old information is England. Why is it old information? Because it was established already in the question. So England, old information, by the time we get to the answer, it's old information, so it goes in the subject, and the new information is the last thing that the user should hear. It makes it more accessible in short-term memory. In this case, do we know user care about England, Wakoriasha? Probably from the previous context, actually. When is England playing next? So we kind of can get that context of user actually care about England. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we can bop with the England schedule, in a sense. Where do you see conversation design going in the next two to three years? One, we'll be getting better at understanding what someone is actually asking for. 
Um, right now, often you have to know exactly what to say to trigger a specific thing you want to happen. So we'll get better at just understanding uh, a lot of different ways that people might want to ask for something. Another thing is I think things will be a little more personalized. So my virtual assistant might get to know me in a different way than it gets to know you and might give me more personalized responses to my questions. To follow up on that, where do you think it'll be in the next 10 to 20 years? Gosh, I mean, who really knows? But um, I can imagine, back to that personalization, perhaps we're going to be in a world where you grow up with a virtual assistant and it understands you really, really well, and it can be your, your confidant. You might be able to talk to it when you have problems and things like that. Also, we'll probably have more things that are more tactile. So we might have a world where instead of having something like a smart speaker that sits on your, your table, maybe we'll have something that you could hold and you could touch and might have a nicer sensation and something that's a little more um, interactive in that way. What are some of the best skills and classes students can begin taking to become a conversational designer? We have a lot of different backgrounds in conversation design. We have people who come from linguistics, uh, computer science, music, psychology. So I think the best conversation designers have a mixture of skill sets. The first one is more on the humanities side, things like psychology, neuroscience, linguistics, where you have a healthy respect and curiosity about how humans actually work. The other side is understanding the technical constraints, because you can design something really interesting and fun, but when you go to your team and say, this is what I want you to develop, they might say, sorry, we can't, the technology can't do that. So it's really good to understand those limitations up front, so be able to design for things that could actually be built. Uh, when we're designing conversations, context is so important. Um, it's important to know what the persona is, what the user said beforehand, what they were seeing, what the situation is, what um, category of topics we're talking about because um, what the assistant says might vary a lot depending on that context. Following up on that, do you think having a background in psychology or social sciences can help? Absolutely. My background, my undergraduate degree is in cognitive science. I didn't know it at the time, but I feel like a lot of those classes really helped me because you really have to understand that people don't all fit into a box and speak the same way. So if you ask me, would you like a cup of coffee? And I say, coffee will keep me awake. Is that a yes or a no answer? It could be either. If it's in the morning and I've got a big assignment, it's probably a yes. If it's right before bed, it's probably a no. If I'm sitting in your room and I say, mm, I'm kind of cold, I'm probably saying, can you please close the window? This is to say we are not always direct in the way that we speak to each other. So if you study psychology, you understand that and you're more likely to build a more inclusive design that handles a large variety of ways people speak. What is the hardest thing about being a conversational designer? I think a lot of it has to do with awareness around conversation design, that it's a thing, and that it requires some design skills. A lot of times I see companies who say, hey, we have a brand, we want to get it out there with voice, and they hire a couple developers and they're off to the races, right? And I want to say, okay, great, but slow down. You want to make sure that you're spending time thinking about the design um, because it's going to really impact your user experience. A lot of times if users encounter a poor experience, they won't come back, right? It's especially true for voice. If they try something on a voice-only experience like playing music and it doesn't work, they're going to go back to doing it the way they always did on their phone or whatever. So you've kind of got one chance to get it right. And if you're concerned about that, then you need to have conversation design as part of your strategy, as part of your plan. The other thing that um, I'm really happy that we thought about was the tone and the persona of our dialogue, because the assistant is the same assistant that would give you information about the most recent salmonella outbreak. And now the assistant is giving you information about um, one of your most favorite hobbies or leisure activities and um, so we've done some interesting things here like um, having uh, good news that means England qualifies for the semifinals right and also um, using appropriate vocabulary like 2 nil instead of 2 zero because if we didn't use the right vocabulary users would lose trust they would say well what does this assistant know um, it's not even using the right vocabulary so, so the assistant uh, was able to put on its sports hat without going over the top Right, because all of us, we wear different hats. So um, you could be a parent, you could be somebody's child, you, could, you are somebody's child, right? Uh, you could be um, a mentor to someone, you're a colleague to someone. So we all wear these different hats. In this case, the assistant is putting on its, its sporty hat. Great point. So, Kathy, if people want to learn more about conversational design, where do they go? Google has a great resource. If you go to actions.google.com slash design, 
you'll find tons of information on best practice. Everything from, should I be using voice in this solution I'm trying to build? Voice is not the right thing for everything. Um, how to write sample dialogues, how to do error handling, which is really important, how to do confirmations, lots of tips on how to build great conversational experiences. To follow up on that, what are some of the more interesting use cases you've seen for conversational experiences? Mm. So some of my favorites are the ones that are getting a little more personalized. So for example, um, if I ask, hey Google, is my flight on time? It comes back and says, yes, your flight is leaving at 1 p.m. I find that so much easier than going to my phone where I've got like 10 different airline apps and I can never remember how to log into. Um, or saying, you know, when is my order coming in? Or things like that. To me, that's the beauty of this frictionless experience where I don't have to sit there and think which app do, you know, how do I log in, all these things. I just ask for what I want and I get the response. So, Kathy, I've heard a lot of talk lately about this book you wrote about designing for voice. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? So what I wanted to do was capture a lot of the things we have learned over the years about how to do best practices for conversation design and put them in one place. And I got to speak to a lot of experts in the field um, and get a lot of good wisdom to put in the book to hopefully be a resource for anyone out there who's interested in creating these conversational experiences.